Welcome to today's masterclass. My name is Jose Rivera. I am the CEO of CSIA, and I will be your host today. In case you don't know about CSIA, we are a global nonprofit trade association with around 500 members in 35 countries. For system integrators, the CSIA Best Practices Manual and CSIA Certification are some of the more popular member benefits, but they also enjoy a variety of others, including professional development, learning from their peers, and access to professional services experts, including insurance, financial, and legal, who understand the system integrator's unique business needs. For partner members, CSIA offers an ecosystem to grow their system integration programs understand their customers' pain points, monitor industry trends, and share their thought leadership. With thousands of qualified integrators and suppliers, the CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange helps system integrators, industry suppliers, and manufacturers connect and do business. For system integrators and partners, it provides a platform to support your content and see SEO marketing efforts, position yourself as a thought leader, and nurture prospects during the complicated buyer's journey. We're now halfway through the year and both members dues and exchange profit up, upgrades are prorated. In other words, they're half off. And we have put together a first timer package for companies that join in July and August that includes some new member benefits, including an e-publication, of new products and services called Innovation for Integration. The package includes a free listing in the new EPUB, but also some other goodies that help you get your message and brand in front of your customers. Get all the details at www.controlsys.org backslash shine. At this time, I would like to introduce the speakers for today, Clint Bundy and Stuart Carlin, our managing directors, with Bundy Group, a boutique investment bank that specializes in representing business owners and management teams in business sales, capital raises, and acquisitions. The Bundy Group spe team specializes in the controls and automation market and has advised numerous automation companies in M&A and capital raise events, including Dorset Controls, MedShift, Custom Controls, Unlimited, and Gray Matter. Without any further ado, Uh, thank you, Jose. I uh, do appreciate that introduction. And uh, before we kind of jump into the, the guts of the presentation, I want to just thank uh, the C uh, CSIA as well as you for your partnership efforts in running such a first class organization over the years. Uh, Bundy Group has appreciated being affiliated with the organization and working with you and the members within the organization. So I want to keep us be cognizant of time, so we're going to jump right in here. And uh, I do want to make a note that uh, you should be able to ask questions uh, through the question box throughout the presentation, which we will then address any questions you have at the end of the presentation. Uh, just as a uh, quick introduction about our firm and myself, before I then let Stuart provide an introduction, uh, we are a 32-year-old boutique investment bank. Uh, so what we do is specialize in representing business owners and business sales, capital raises, and acquisitions. Uh, we have been involved in uh, the automation space for a number of years, and uh, certainly I will uh, prov uh, provide further detail in an accompanying slide. But myself, uh, I have been in the business, the investment banking industry for nearly uh, 20 years, uh, with a good chunk of that being involved in both the automation and technology oriented fields, had a prior career with a larger corporate investment bank, which is now Wells Fargo's investment banking unit before coming back to Bundy Group. Uh, Stuart, I'll let you provide an introduction. Thank you, Clinton. Thank you, Jose. Certainly um, happy to be here and, and with all the listeners today. Uh, again, I'm Stuart Carlin, a managing director with Bundy Group, and I co-lead our coverage in the controls and automation space. Uh, my background uh, includes uh, roles in both corporate investment banking, as well as operations roles focused on strategic planning, capital raising, mergers and acquisitions activities for both public and private companies. 
uh, technology and technology enabled services has always been a, a passion of mine and we look to carry that into our work in the controls and automation space as part of Bundy Group. Um, so looking forward to walking you through the presentation, uh, addressing any questions you have. And um, uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn, turn over here to the next slide. So just to provide uh, the viewers with a, a very high level about our firm, and we wanna be clear at the outset that the purpose of the presentation today is to provide education and content and not marketing materials for Bundy Group. But we do think it's important to provide a, a frame of reference for our background because then that provides you some, some better foundation for the accompanying information. So we have, uh, we've been involved uh, in the CSI space and the automation world for well over a decade plus. Um, and I've been going to CSI shows and involved in CSI uh, events for uh, just about that same amount of time. And during that time frame, we have advised, uh, we'll just leave it at many, many companies uh, on both an informal basis as well as representing them in formal business sale, capital raise, or strategic advisory uh, assignments or roles. So we, we would like to think, and we feel we've had this affirmed by a number of friends in the industry that we are one of, if not the most specialized firm in the automation and control system and immigration space. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our core services are a, an M&A event or a business sale event, which can mean 100% sale of a company, or it could mean a sale of, say, a majority equity percentage of a company with the existing owners retaining a minority equity percentage. Uh, we also work with companies in capital raise situations that could be raising capital, debt or equity. It could be to buy out a partner. It could be for growth purposes. They're one of 100 reasons that uh, a company could be in need of capital. And then finally, on strategic advisory, this is often advice and uh, services that we offer it could be right before or it could be several years before an owner is thinking about some kind of exit event or some kind of liquidity event or a capital event. So uh, hopefully that gives everyone a frame of reference about our firm and what we do. We're going to start out with just some observations about the industry and, and what we're seeing within it. And Stuart, I'll let you kick off this page. Sure. And before we, we dive into the specifics about the automation control system integration market, um, one thing I wanted to share and remind the, the listeners of is that um, the, the perspective and the information you're going to hear from us today um, isn't coming through a lens from an academic standpoint, but um, our view is how really how buyers and investors are looking at the industry, uh, evaluating companies in that industry, uh, and ultimately what does that translate into um, what is your, your company or evaluation for your, your business today. So uh, with that backdrop, and I'll, I'll draw your attention to the, the quote in the top right here, um, it's important to note that we're we're presently in a very busy uh, M&A and very healthy M&A environment, particularly for the, the automation and control system integration space. While the pandemic did put uh, a pause on some market activity for a few months last year, it has really come back uh, extremely aggressive for a number of reasons that Clint is going to talk through here in a, in a second. But um, overall, buyers are, are very interested in automation control system integration businesses. Um, we're having a, a lot of activity that's really accelerated over the years, but um, as noted uh, on this slide, uh, really this has been about the busiest we have seen over the past six months than uh, in, in recent history. So um, a very healthy market dynamic. And Clint, I'll, I'll let you talk through some of the underlying growth drivers of, of the market. Yeah, and just to pick up on what Stuart was mentioning, uh, our frame of reference is from what we see as being a boot on the ground in the automation and control, and sy control system integration markets from an M&A and capital raise perspective. So I, we're, we're a very uh, real-time view is the way we would like to look at it. We also work in several other industries, such as technology services and healthcare, 
And what I can tell you from our work is that the automation segment is as appealing to uh, the the buyer community. And whether I when I say buyers, that could mean strategic buyers or private equity groups. It is as attractive as just about any other market out there uh, uh, in terms of a, uh, being a lucrative um, and being a, a haven for uh, putting money to work, for lack of a better term. And, and what are the drivers behind that? Well, a number of these, I think a lot of the audience members here today will probably be able to relate to most, if not all of these, but workforce shortages. I mean, I don't know if there's a company today that isn't talking about the challenges they're having finding talent. And uh, within that, uh, you know, part of the solution has, has got to be using uh, automation tools. And, and certainly uh, we feel like from uh, COVID, this is only going to continue to accelerate because of this talent shortfall we're seeing. Uh, increased digitization, of course, we're seeing this with the rapid adoption of IIoT and the market's need to digitize. This is going to continue to drive the automation space, monitoring requirements. We just as a frame of reference, one of the deals we did recently, Dorset Technologies, uh, was a company that was heavy in the water wastewater space. Well, a lot of the automation and monitoring requirements within that segment are driven by local, state, federal, EPA regulatory demands. Uh, productivity. Uh, you know, I read a recent stat that uh, that uh, a seasoned expert in the operations space feels like throughput could be increased for most companies by anywhere from four to eight percent by using automation, which that will certainly translate to the bottom line. Uh, market education, this is really specific to the system and greater community. Um, and this won't be the last time you'll hear me say this on this uh, presentation. You, know, you all are on the front lines of educating and implementing these systems. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a snowballing effect. You all are educating, which then entices your client sectors once they see the results to then pick right back up and implement more monitoring solutions. And then goals. I mean, this is just a, this stat it just speaks for itself where a, over 50 percent of business leaders today are talking more about automation solutions as a result of the pandemic. So we could easily go into a whole bunch of other drivers above and beyond what we've just listed here. But these are some of the core ones that we wanted to highlight. And continuing on with that that theme and what you'll see on, on this slide related to the automation market and the next slide uh, related to the control system integration market is really putting some numbers to uh, that those strong fundamentals and that growth profile of, of each uh, space. So I'm um, just picking a, a, a few highlights here. Um, you know, in 2020, global automation market um, estimated at approximately $175 billion. That's, that's forecasted to grow. 9% uh, per year, year over year for the next five years. Um, and what that translates to and how that impacts, um, you know, our conversation today and, and some of the themes you'll hear is around topics of, of valuation and stimulating competition. So the, the box in the top right here, you'll see over uh, 1,100 um, total deals over the past five years with $163 billion in, in cumulative value. So the, the, as Clint said, um, the, the interest level in uh, the controls and automation space really, um, you know, really right up there with a lot of the other very resilient industries like healthcare. Um, and uh, again, bringing it back to what does that ultimately mean for, for business owners today? Well, when you have um, strong underlying fundamentals uh, and you have a lot of competition and interest in that marketplace, um, that's going to have valuation uh, implications. And you can see in a few of these boxes at the bottom of the slide, we've highlighted where uh, valuation multiples in the, in the controls and automation space um, are falling. And you can see in, in many cases, the, the, um, the transaction value quoted as a multiple, and just for, for listeners who may not be familiar with that, um, ultimately, we're, we're 
equating the transaction value to uh, a portion of revenue or a portion of EBITDA. So when we talk about uh, a 10 times multiple, if you will, that would be uh, 10 times transaction value over adjusted uh, or EBITDA. Um, and you'll see those, those pushing into very, very healthy uh, ranges. And, and we'll, we'll tie that back into a bit more in terms of what that means for, for value as well. So the, the control system integration space is uh, from a, a market perspective and how the, let's call it the M&A market looks at it, is a niche, a very niche oriented sector. Um, it's, mind you, it's a, it's a $24 billion market niche. So it's, I, it's part of why Bundy Group uh, has, has enjoyed and continues to enjoy working in, in this unique and interesting space, which is it's unique, but yet it's still very sizable. Um, and where we sit today is that we view and the, the numbers back it up is that this is a growth oriented market, 24 billion roughly today, growing globally into about a $32 billion market by 2026. So it's about a 6% growth rate from a market perspective, which is very healthy. Um, and it has scale. Uh, you know, we, we the well-timed uh, J.P. Morgan CSIA uh, survey report came out, which we thought there were some just interesting uh, figures to point out from that, which we can validate from our work in the industry. And in this chart in the top right, you'll see where the, the expectations of past performance versus future expectations for integrators out there. Well, the report validates what, we, what we're seeing and hearing, which is integrators had some impact over the past, call it 12 to 18 months from the pandemic. Um, we, I don't know if I heard of any integrator tell me my client base disappeared or we lost demand or um, or I've, our business model fundamentally cratered. We heard none of that sort of overly pessimistic views. What we did hear is, hey, what we've seen is project work is delayed, it shifted, which has decreased my performance for 2020 but also had the corresponding impact of increasing performance in 2021 and beyond. So the next, uh, both from what we see in the JP Morgan survey, as well as what we're seeing from our client work is the future looks very, very bright for system integrators. And you can see some other uh, key stats here at the bottom. Um, you know, only 35% 30, uh, integrators felt that they're, impact the, the business was not impacted by the pandemic. And, um, and then you've got some other key information about how uh, confident they feel in their clients to pick up their purchasing and investment habits with automation. So, so in, in conjunction with the previous slide, we wanted to kind of further our, our observations on the control system integration market. And really, again, our view is not from an academic point of view, but it's how to how does the M&A market view it? Um, because this is also how we view it as we're working the best position, our clients in a sale or capital raise process, because we always want to put our clients in the best position of strength possible. And this is, again, another page where we could have easily gone three or four pages deep with information, but wanted to just capture some, some quality information um, the system integrator community and the firms within it, your value added services providers, companies, your clients lean heavily on you um, for, for the solutions that you deliver, recurring revenues. So this is a term that's very important in the M&A market today. Buyers, whether it be strategic buyers or private equity groups, they're always talking to businesses and they're talking to investment banking advisors like Bundy Group about what kind of recurring revenue does a company have? How predictable is that revenue? How do we know that the, if they had a peak year in one year, that's not going to just fall off a cliff and go down the next year? So, you know, from our work and, and our positioning with on behalf of our system integrator clients, most integrators have either a pure recurring revenue or they have what I like to call recurring like revenue, which is mean you means you have the same clients often coming back time and time again, year after year, finish this project, go on to this one, finish this one, go on to that one. Buyers like that a lot. It's predictability. They can, they can underwrite on that. Flight to quality. So as I mentioned earlier, 
capital groups, especially. I mean, this is sophisticated, well-educated capital that really does their homework on good industries to invest in. And they view um, the system integration space to be a, a very safe segment to put money into. We've talked about growth in the prior page. So it's a growth oriented market consolidation. Uh, let me explain why consolidation is important is uh, that buyers can come in and acquire a, a larger system integrator or a larger automation firm. And then they can turn around and buy smaller automation and or system integration firms and bolt them up underneath their platform and get synergies, which ultimately that's sort of the premise of one plus one equals three, where they have the, the platform plus the add-on plus the synergies helps them get a higher return on their investment. And in concept helps them to, to, to get that higher return while also providing uh, more capabilities and, and a better, better, even better services and offerings to their clients. Uh, scarcity value, simply put, there are more buyers out there interested in getting in the automation space today than there are uh, worthwhile uh, and attractive companies to pursue. So that certainly is uh, effectively creates a seller's market. And we don't see that changing anytime in the near future. And then position of strength. And this is something we're going to talk about. Uh, Stuart is going to talk about in another slide or two. But at the end of the day, uh, we want a client to always be in the best position of strength possible when they're selling. And in this space, the system integration community, more times than not, we have kind of the right fundamentals to show which places a system integrator in that right position of strength. So how this translates or, or trying to tie this all, all back together, we've heard about the um, strong underlying fundamentals. We've heard about some of the key value parameters that Clint walked through on the last slide. And, and what we've, we've put together here is just really a, a mapping, not of all, but just some notable transactions, both uh, deals that we have done, as well as some other notable industry deals in, in, in the control system integration space. And really the key takeaway for this slide is if you note the level of activity increase over the past um, few years really talks to a lot of the points that Clint highlighted on the past slide in terms of a flight to quality, uh, buyers and capital providers looking to uh, invest with um, uh, businesses with strong fundamentals, with good stability, profitability, growth characteristics. And, you know, starting uh, back with uh, uh, an early deal we did, the Ram Motors and Controls deal in 2013, and then fast forwarding today, um, the, the number of deals happening in the activity, um, as well as the, the size of the pipeline that, that we see today in terms of, of uh, recently closed deals, as well as up and coming deals, um, is really, uh, and Clint can correct me if I'm wrong here, but at a really an all time high uh, for us. Um, a, a lot of frequent phone calls, a lot of buyer activity. I think part of that is driven because um, uh, private equity groups and, and buyers who may have been focused in other areas are now moving over towards more resilient markets uh, in pursuing those opportunities. But um, all good, again, tying back to the underlying fundamentals of the market. Um, Clint, do you want to uh, pick a couple deals to, to talk about on this slide? Yeah, and this is one of these slides that I could probably spend an hour alone on. And, and we certainly have by no means listed out all the relevant transactions, whether it be to the automation space or the control system integration space. But a few just to kind of cherry pick here, uh, you'll see two different private equity backed platforms that have been active in the space over the past, call it uh, really five, six years. One is uh, LFM Capital owns Eckhart, which was uh, initially an, an automotive, automotive heavy automation firm, a lot on the manufacturing side, but they've since successfully diversified with the several acquisitions on the system integration side. Uh, as an aside, by the way, LFM Capital also owns another automation firm called PSI Controls. Um, and then another group uh, that's active in uh, the market is uh, Falfurious Capital, which purchased uh, e-technologies a few years ago 
and then successfully completed several add-ons, which included Glen Mount Global, uh, Superior Controls, uh, were two key ones that that they successfully executed on. And um, and then another one that certainly this deal gets a lot of airtime in the, the industry because it, I think it really set the, the market for a multiple, which is the JR Automation Hitachi deal, which JR Automation, very, very large automation and system integration firm, uh, was owned by a private equity group called Crestview Capital. Uh, that deal traded uh, at a uh, at a high teens transaction value to uh, EBITDA multiple, and there were there were certainly a lot of synergies to be had between Hitachi and JR, which is a major reason for that multiple, as well as the fact the company had scale. And then just from a few that we have worked on, uh, I mean, just our past let's call it 18 months to two years, even throughout COVID have been very busy on the automation side. We worked with on the Emerge Systems Gray Matter transaction. Uh, we were representative of Dorset T- Technologies as Stuart mentioned earlier and a sale to a private equity group. Um, we worked with Custom Controls Unlimited and a sale to Inframark. And then we expect to ha- have another deal announcement uh, in the system integration space to occur here in the coming weeks and then have a pretty healthy pipeline of other opportunities um, in the space. So uh, again, our being on the front lines, plus the information we have from a market perspective, helps us to, gives us an informed view that this is a very attractive, consolidating and and in capital uh, lucrative industry that that you all and Bundy Group are active in. And keeping keeping that theme going, um, really, Again, trying to kind of tie this all together. So our, our work in the space, um, really the, the boots on the ground approach to, you know, looking at the activity going on, the trends, the key players working uh, with clients actively in the space, um, as well as ongoing conversations. Um, we wanted to, to share our perspective here, and I'm going to go a little bit out of order in terms of the bullets. Uh, for the benefit of, of all the owners that are listening, whether or not um, a, an M&A event, whether it be a capital raise or a sale is, is in, in the future or, or on your mind at this time or at some point down the road, um, there are really some, some key uh, themes that we want to take away from kind of the, the industry observations and section. Um, first uh, is, you know, focusing on building value in your businesses uh, and refining the, the, the model is, is critical and sure to pay off um, both now uh, as well as in the future when you are considering uh, some type of activity. Um, continuing to uh, really invest in building out your team, the skilled talent base, um, refining your recruiting, your training and development practices, and, and uh, building out that organization. And there's a lot of a lot of the transactions that were listed on the past on the past slide, as well as conversations we have going on, are really centered around um, expanding teams as part of that consolidation model. And with uh, the workforce shortages we have today, um, a lot of times the the way to to get that talent is through uh, acquisitions for some of the larger consolidators out there. So, um, you know, the, the the time invested today, whether an M and A event is uh, in the next twelve months or down the road, will certainly uh, pay dividends. Um, as we've talked about, um, you know, very highly coveted market with strong fundamentals. Um, but really what this all translates to is, you know, buyers are, are prudent, um, no matter what and how, how glamorous the, the fundamentals are, if you will. Uh, but uh, effectively managing a competitive process um, coupled with uh, a carefully crafted story highlighting the strengths of business, that's what's really critical in driving um, the valuation and successful outcomes uh, when pursuing an m a uh, m a event having a good team of advisors behind you uh, a carefully thought out and planned process and one of the things you'll hear us talk about in a little bit is um, you know some of the things to think about as you look at continuing to build value and uh, and invest in your organization 
Um, Clint, anything else you want to add on this slide before we continue on? No, I, I think this is where having uh, staying one uh, up to date, which you all, uh, each of you are doing by listening to this presentation on what's happening in the market is critical to having a good group of advisors around you can really uh, make the difference in terms of a successful outcome and frankly, a, uh, a good versus great uh, valuation. All right, so uh, moving on into the, to the next section, we're gonna dive a little bit more into the topic of, of valuation and, and value building, uh, if you will. Clint, you wanna lead us off on this slide? Sure, and we, we are used to, in just about every one of these presentations, getting the question, well, what, what are the multiples? Um, and uh, after doing enough of these over the years, we felt like, well, let's just go ahead jump ahead and give at least some guidance because we always want to we always want to try to give as much helpful information as we can but let me start out with a very key point which is valuation for any company is ultimately determined by the, the a willing buyer and a willing seller but it's and it's fundamentally driven by the pool of buyers and how competitive that process is as Stuart mentioned earlier um, you know, the only way to really maximize the multiple, and get it to the right multiple is through some element of competition or at least perceived competition, um, which is a, a playbook that Bundy Group is obviously well adapted and informed at, at working with clients on. From a, as I mentioned earlier, there's the platform approach and then there's an add-on approach. And the truth is, is that some integrators are large enough to be considered a platform investment. And then a whole lot of others are going to be really more in the add-on territory. And that's not a good or a bad for, for either segment, but what it can mean is a difference in terms of uh, where valuation ranges fall out. Um, so for my platform scale, usually, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this in quotes, usually uh, your EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA is gonna be 5 million or, or greater. But let me give a but to that. But we certainly have seen platform investments occur that have been smaller than five in EBITDA. Um, EBITDA margins, which that would be EBITDA divided by revenue, usually is a loose parameter starting at around 15%. Can go lower, can go higher. Certainly we've had, had clients that have been in the mid to high 20s, but 15% is kind of a good bogey to use. And kind of with those boxes checked, you know, the, a wide range for a platform, you could be looking where from kind of eight times transaction value to EBITDA up into just loosely the mid-teens. Um, as we saw from the, the, the JR Automation deal, that deal went higher, transacted at higher than mid-teens, but that was probably a little more the exception than the rule. Um, so again, hopefully we're giving some, some good rough guidance at least or fairly definitive guidance on the platform front. From the, for the add-on size, most add-ons are going to be less than 5 million in EBITDA. Um, still probably with a very similar EBITDA margin profile, let's call it maybe 12 to 15% range. And you know our range here uh, is gonna be wider in terms of transaction value to EBITDA multiples. And we kind of use it as a starting point of roughly around five times. And then that can run up into the, let's call it the lower double digits in terms of transaction value to EBITDA. So uh, again, our goal here is just to give some framework and, and hopefully um, hopefully that gives everybody some guidance. Stuart, why don't you walk us through a little bit around the technology integrated services piece? Yeah, and and um, this, this ties into, or one of the questions we may get out of this is, you know, wow, those are pretty, those are pretty wide valuation ranges. Why, why is that and what's driving that? And there are a few factors that really, um, that really drive that outside of just the, the size of the EBITDA or the EBITDA margins. Um, you know, one of them is the level of integration of technology into the service offering. So is there proprietary technology in place um, how is that technology being uh, monetized as part of the business model? So really, what is what is the business doing? How is the lemonade stand?
and running and how are they leveraging technology to um, do a lot of the things we talked about earlier in terms of uh, improving efficiencies, improving uh, and, and um, expanding utilization capabilities of existing systems and what have you. And uh, the, the more uh, integration there is and, and the more technology is enabling those services, um, the, the, the more, uh, I won't say um, will, but could result or allow the multiple ranges to shift um, higher. Uh, another um, aspect of, um, and, and you'll actually hear us talk about it on the next slide uh, in terms of valuation is gonna be um, the, the quality of the information available and the data available. So ultimately, when you do get to the point one day where you're considering uh, an, uh, an M&A event and planning for a process, you want to make sure that you have high quality, uh, both financial as well as operational data available, because the more transparency um, and defensibility you can build into um, the, the story of your business and the better you connect the story and positioning with the data, uh, the less perceived risk um, you can portray to buyers in a process. Uh, and again, that can also um, provide the ability to push valuation ranges um, a little bit into the, the higher territory. Uh, and the last piece um, is really, as we touched on earlier, um, competition in the marketing process. So uh, what it all comes back to is having a good mix of quality buyers, uh, stimulating competition in that process, providing good information. Uh, and that level of competition is ultimately uh, going to be what translates to um, the, the end valuation for, uh, for the company. Um, Clint, anything else you wanna add on that topic or you wanna jump to the next slide? Let's jump on to the next one to keep us on pace here. Okay. Um, so on this slide, we're, we'll talk a little bit about the, um, you know, how do you think about building value or what, more importantly, what criteria are buyers and investors looking at when they're assessing uh, a company? Um, and we like to talk about it as, as three legs of a stool are going to be the three primary um primary uh, things that they look at to start. Uh, the stability of the historical performance, the profitability of the company, which we talked about on the last slide in terms of EBITDA and EBITDA margin size, and the growth. So uh, from a stability of historical performance, this gets back to the recurring or the recurring-like nature of the business. So um, proving that uh, you're able to deliver and showing that you're able to deliver um, on your, your revenue targets, your margin profile, uh, and really show that positive trend or that stable trend over time uh, is one. Two, um, really ties in with the scale of the business uh, and that platform versus add-on uh, example that Clint provided on the last slide. Where do you fall in the spectrum of EBITDA size and EBITDA margin size. Uh, and the last piece being growth, um, an important one, not just the historical track record of growth, but what does the pipeline of opportunities look like today? We showed on previous slides a lot of information about um, you know, the, the underlying trends, the future growth, the market growing at you know, six plus percent uh, year over year for the next five years. That's all going to help uh, the control system integration in, in businesses to grow, but also how has your pipeline changed over time? And what we're seeing with uh, control system integrators that we work it, with is very healthy pipelines. While COVID did uh, have a, a, a pause, um, it, was, it wasn't a lost opportunity. It was a shift in opportunity. And so for those of you who may be asking yourself, okay, well, what you know, my, my business had, you know, some impact for uh, in 2020, how does that get considered into looking at um, stability and profitability and growth? And, and the answer is, um, first and foremost, was that lost work or was that a shift in work? And where that's a shift in, in work during the process planning and preparation phase, we do a lot of work in 
uh, articulating that and putting numbers to that in terms of how how the business uh, looks today, how it looked in 2020, and then what what was that movement or what was that shift? Um, and the better we're able to define that and explain that to buyers, uh, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're going to get discounted because you had that shift. Uh, so long as you have the appropriate uh, metrics and information, and again, you build the, the story supported by uh, strong financials and, and operational data, you're able to um, uh, really introduce what the industry is referred to as um, EBITDAC, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and COVID. Um, and uh, that does uh, get factored into um, conversations around uh, strength of the business, but also translates to valuation uh, parameters as well. Um, just a cherry picking a couple other key factors, um, certainly not secondary, um, just as important. Uh, strength of the management team uh, in the organization. Uh, we, you've heard us talk a few times about uh, talent, skilled labor. Um, that's really arguably the fourth uh, leg of the stool, um, in my mind. Uh, it's a very uh, strong focus for uh, buyers, investors, consolidators in the space, um, and, and, and one that really gets a lot, of, uh, a lot of time in terms of understanding uh, where your talent pool is, where that skilled labor is, where the time and the resources and the utilization um, metrics are, uh, which, which translate to, uh, again, um, building value and improving that um, wealth creation event uh, when uh, it, it is time for an M and A activity. Um, Clint, anything else you want to add? Yeah, you know, I think you've covered the base as well. I just what I would encourage all owners and senior managers to do is you need to do almost like an annual checkup on a lot of these key points. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon for our team to, to have a, a periodic conversation with owners and review information that they provide us or uh, have some conversations around their some of these key fundamentals stewards mentioned because, you know, ultimately these are these are the drivers that can be the difference maker between trading at a multiple here versus a multiple plus 40% and in couple with, of course, the competitive process. So uh, I would encourage all owners, senior managers, being a constant state of evaluating, am I ticking most, if not all these boxes? No company's perfect. But, uh, you know, I, I think it was Vince Lombardi who said, we're not going to obtain perfection, but we're going to sure try. And uh, I think that's a mentality that most owners would recommend try. Yeah, just to round out the presentation here, just a uh, snapshot of some of our work, which we mentioned earlier, just gives you a flavor again for our experience in the space. Uh, so several transactions that we've accomplished. And then following this page, you'll see a case study, which uh, for those who uh, would like to receive our presentation, we'll have our contact information on the last slide here, which you can jot down or go to our website and get our contact information. And email us and we will send you the presentation. Uh, I believe CSI is gonna make available the uh, webinar uh, recording. So you'll have that also as a frame of reference. But uh, we're gonna stop here. And I believe we've had maybe a question or two already get fielded, but I'll let Stuart um, play both moderator as well as he'll, he and I will answer any questions that are out there. Yeah, Clint, I'll, uh, I'll have you answer. Um, we had a question come in when we were talking about, you know, value building. Um, it, in addition to um, the quality of the financial, the operational data and thinking about building value, um, why don't you talk a little bit about how important uh, employee uh, agreements are to, um, to that talent uh, factor? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and that's a very important question because as Stuart mentioned earlier, a lot of acquisitions today are, are, are being completed in the system integration space with uh, in senior management and skilled employee talent, talent being a key thesis for the transaction. There's even a term out there that's being used called acquihire, which is I as a buyer, I'm gonna go out and buy 
I'm going to buy more talent by completing an acquisition. And so as the, um, as the question points to, I mean, this, this goes to a very foundational item in a lot of transactions, which is, well, who should sign an employment agreement? And an employment agreement is usually uh, giving you a non-lawyer uh, commentary on what an employment agreement is. An employment agreement is where uh, uh, effectively the buying company is going to have a contractual obligation to a key management member usually, uh, and it's going to dictate things like compensation, period of time that the employee and employer and employee will agree to to be married together. Um, issues like firing for calls versus firing without calls, and what are the remedies for that? And so the key question I always kind of look at when I when I'm looking at this situation, is, and I often get asked by owners, is who's going to have to sign an employment agreement, and there's not a hard and fast on that, on this answer, but generally any owner who sits in a, in a, any shareholder that also sits in a senior management capacity, they almost always are going to have to sign an employment agreement, which by the way, will usually include some kind of uh, non-compete terms within it as well. Where it can become more of a gray area is for senior managers who are not a shareholder and yet they may be very critical to the operations. Well, most buyers are gonna to want to have them under some kind of employment agreement. There's not, not always the case, but usually the case. And so where the, the complexity can get introduced is if that a, a key employee does not own equity in the company, but yet is being asked to sign an employment agreement by a new owner, you know, there, there can be some, let's just call it, discussions and gym, uh, mental gymnastics that have to go through and even mechanics that have to be fulfilled to make that sort of palatable for all parties. And certainly an area that we're, we're used to, to working with both the client as well as a client's attorney and the buyer to navigate. Stuart, I, I, I don't seem, go ahead. I, I have one question, uh, being a panelist, I cannot put it in the Q and A box. It's a question slash comment. So I have heard anecdotally about some owners of system integration companies taking off uh, for a long vacation. And with that, are able to demonstrate to potential buyers that they have a strong management team because they can continue their operation without them being on a day-to-day. -day. Any comments on that? Yeah, I think I'll... Uh... I'll start off, off, and if Clint wants to add anything, he's welcome to. Um, it's certainly, uh, I'll say, a tool that can be used. Um, but uh, for for us in our processes, I think what um, what really it boils down to is um, who are the customer relationships residing with, um, who's overseeing uh, the various day to day operational functions. Um, and how critical is, um, you know, the, the, the key owner, leadership, shareholder in each of those aspects. And so what buyers will often do is they'll approach that question from a few different ways. So being able to say, well, you know, hey, look, I can, you know, I can take an extended vacation and the wheels don't fall off the bus and everything uh, runs well and my margins don't take a hit um, is certainly one uh, component of that. But also, um, you know, who is who's managing the client relationships, the ongoing relationships on a day to day basis? Um, who is keeping an eye on uh, the, the 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 field? Um, who's keeping an eye on the projects? Who's managing each aspect of each project in different line of revenue, if you will? And to the extent um, those questions are answered, uh, I'll say at the next. Uh, the next level of the org chart, if you will, in terms of that key senior leadership team, um, that's ultimately what buyers are, are, are looking for. And, and frankly, it's okay if um, there are some responsibilities that reside. Uh, it, it isn't a, hey, I have to be completely disconnected. Um, there are ways to work around that. But um, you know, to directly answer your question, Jose, it can be, it can be a good tool, uh, but it would need to be one of many. I'll just Thank add, I, Tom, Tom Dorsett with Dorset Technologies had a, uh, the business was headquartered in, in Charlotte, North, or excuse me, uh, just north of Charlotte. Um, 
that Tom Dorsett had a beach house in Key West and made a point of spending a lot of time there so that buyers knew and had evidence that he wasn't hanging around the hoop all the time. So I, I certainly don't hate the playbook of an owner proving to buyers by uh, spending large chunks of time away from the business. I don't hate that playbook because it does help us validate the strength of the standalone management team. Thank you. Stuart, let me ask you a question on process. What, what are the, just doing the kind of the immediate run up to a sale process, uh, what, what are some just very kind of low hanging fruit things that uh, a business owner needs to do? And then in conjunction with that, how long should it, they expect if they're going to sell or, or do a capital raise? How long should they expect that to take from the moment? Let's say that an advisor like Bundy Groups. Yeah, th thanks, Clint. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the second uh, question. Um, the on average uh, today, I'll say a process is typically running around you know, anywhere between um, seven to nine months, uh, start to finish. It does, there are situations where it will push ahead into, um, you know, the, the six month territory and also situations where it may stretch out longer. But um, I would be, I would be targeting that kind of seven to seven to nine months uh, timeframe. Um, within that time frame, there's really uh, a few key um uh, process phases. The first phase is going to be uh, the information gathering preparation phase where um, you're working amongst yourselves to uh, gather the a lot of the information we talked about, the operational information, the operational data, financial information, uh, and then working with your uh, your uh, controller, CFO, advisory team in pulling together um, a lot of the, the financial modeling, the pipeline information that, again, helps buyers see what the runway looks like, as well as what the business has done historically. Um, once all that data is together and the marketing process starts, you're really running towards the first uh, inflection point, which is the indication of interest round. That's the first time buyers uh, really put pen to paper and say, hey, here's how I'm thinking about uh, tr structuring a transaction and typically a range of values. Uh, from there, um, the buyers move from, uh, you know, kind of checking out the car from the outside to popping the hood and opening the glove box and really getting to know how the business runs uh, through, through either in-person or virtual management meetings, um, as well as requesting more detailed information on the business um, in run up to letters of intent um, when a letter of intent is signed, that's where you're, you know, you have vetted the buyers, you have provided and hopefully completed uh, most of the, the initial and commercial due diligence, uh, and you're moving, marching towards closing. And that closing time frame uh, is usually somewhere around 60 to 90 days. Um, Clay, we, we had a question come through uh, while we were speaking. Um, uh, we noted the difference in valuations um, in platform versus add-on. Uh, do you see similar differences in terms of valuations, whether it's a private equity buyer or a strategic buyer? Yeah, re really good question. Uh, so yes and no. <laughs> uh, and I, I was I like to say, I'll start with the MBA answer. It depends. Um, what I would say in general is that a strategic buyer, a seasoned strategic buyer and a private equity buyer will have similar, similar mindsets in terms of uh, my goal is, is to generate a return off of buying this company. Uh, and to do that, I need to make sure I buy it the right price, which I'm gonna use that in quotes. Um, and then I see the growth that's needed uh, and the improvements if ne are needed to then whether I resell it, which is eventually a private equity group will resell it, or I just keep it as a, an ongoing subsidiary of, of my strategic operations, they still have to achieve the same kind of let's call it I internal rate of return objectives or similar internal, internal rate of return objectives. Now, there can be one of several major differences between a strategic and a peg, a strategic in concept 
should be able to yield what we call more synergies out of a transaction than a private equity group who's doing an initial platform investment. So a strategic should be able to come in and buy an add-on and be able to say, you know, we can help increase your revenue or we can remove duplicative costs that exist between your co- your organization and ours, which should naturally ri- increase the EBITDA in a pretty short-term nature. And because of that, a strategic should, in concept, be able to pay a higher valuation than a private equity group. Now, that being said, in theory, that's correct. But in practice, we have seen plenty of cases where private equity groups have outbid strategic buyers for platform acquisitions uh, and add-on acquisitions. Um, But on the add-on front, that means that a private equity group already owns a platform, and thus we actually call them more of a quasi-strategic. So Falfurious owns e-technologies. If e-technologies is looking at an add-on deal, while they may be backed by Falfurious, we still view that as a strategic buyer versus, say, um, a large institution like, a, 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 you know, an, an Emerson or a Rockwell, you know, those are more traditional strategics that are out there in the automation space today. So, Stuart, feel free to chime in if there are any other comments you'd like to add to that. No, I think you did, covered it. So I think at this time I would like to, to close. So I'm going to share here. So on behalf of CSIA, I would like to thank Clint and Stuart for this great presentation. I definitely think we're going through a very interesting period in uh, in the time of the system integration market. And um, CSIA tries to keep the pulse on, on, the, on the market. We try to put in the newsletter a corner for M&A news. And uh, now and then we have Clint um, uh, provide information that we include. The other one that we have done is for the easy stats which we share with our members, we ask the question, given that the M&A market is so hot, are you ready to answer the door when somebody comes to knocking on the door for a possible deal? And I welcome you to go to our Easy Stats monthly results. Look for that one because I think the responses are very interesting. So I would like to remind you that this recording, the recording of this event will be available in a few days you know, for, for later viewing. Please share to Mark, there are multiple of these events. We're having them basically on a weekly basis. Uh, Mark your calendar, they're all very interesting. And um, we're here for you. If you have more questions, uh, please contact us, specifically uh, at CSIA. And thank you very much. We look forward for the next event and to continue our relationship with the Bundy Group. Thank you, gents. Thank you, Jose. Thank you.